Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Full Cast and Crew podcast. This is episode 146. And today we're going to be talking about the great James L. Brooks film broadcast news with my frequent contributor, Richard Brown. Richard, welcome back once again to the Full Cast and Crew podcast. Thanks. It's always a privilege. A privilege and a pleasure for me. Now, today we're going to be talking, as I said, about broadcast news, which I was thrilled to revisit. It's one of those films. I don't know if you have other films like this. I'm so familiar with the film. I've seen it so many times that I sort of forget a lot about it. (laughs) Does that make any sense? Um, Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, I'm so familiar with it that when I watched it again, it was kind of like watching it for the first time. What is that phenomena? Uh, Well, I don't know what to call it exactly other than if there's if you've seen it a bunch of times and then you don't see it for a while, you know, maybe your brain is anticipating something very specific from your memory. But then you start to see uh, all kinds. You start to see the the uh, the details and the dialogue or the scenes that you didn't mention that you that you that didn't register uh, with you before. And so it's like it's almost new every time you see it. Well, like, for example, I'd completely forgotten there was an introductory section of the film that showed all of our protagonists as children. Completely yeah. forgot that that existed entirely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure I love that part, to be honest with you. Do you think you need that? I don't know. It comes off a little corny to me. I'm not sure if if it is if that little piece is that it's not well done or if it's just not necessary. I think it's not necessary. I think it's actually I think it's executed pretty well with child actors, which, as we know, is a fraught tableau to begin with. (laughs) Right. However, I'm not sure it adds anything to what we already have. It would be interesting to watch a version of the film with that big introductory section lopped off. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it would really matter because the characterizations are so, so good that. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff is is displayed. But, you know, I forgive the film that quick, a little background just in the the James L. Brooks cinematic universe. We've talked about him a couple of times on the pod. You've guessed it on the pod. We did an excellent episode covering Taxi. And I hope you noted the little taxi casting shout out in broadcast news. You mean uh, Jeff, the uh, (laughs) cab driver at the end? Yes, Jeff, the cab driver at the end. I was glad you noticed that. Should we have to do I have to explain what it is? No, I think we will send. He was people. always, you know, he was the. He, OK, no, I mean, you know, if, you, if you'd like to give an ode, to, I think any attention to Jeff is good. Well, actually, he's not bad. I mean, he, he started out as just an extra on al- almost every episode of Taxi, and then they turned him into an actual character. I think he gave him a couple of uh, a couple of, epi- you know, yeah, he had a couple episodes character driven episodes by the end. Yeah. Yeah. And he, uh, and he was a good actor. Funny. He, he's a funny actor. Anyway, uh, he shows up. He shows up as a cab driver. <laughs> he's really expanded. In a cameo. Jim Brooks really expanded his 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 acting reach by giving him the role of a cab driver. I mean, couldn't he put Jim <laughs> on the line at the control room in broadcast news? Maybe like Jeff rather. Right. Or make him, a, you know, make him a TV producer. Yeah, make him a TV producer. Why not? Anyway, so Jim Brooks at the time of broadcast news, which was the year I am filling 1987. Yeah. Which is a great year. I graduated high school in 1987. I don't know about you. Uh, I was one year behind you. Oh, that's right. You graduated in 88. And then you went right to college. Hampshire College, where Richard and I met. Um, yeah. So Jim Brooks in 1987 is coming off his massive hit, Terms of Endearment, which was an astounding success. It had a budget of only $8 million and a box office of $165 million, probably Mm -hmm. one of the most successful films of its year. Broadcast News was Mm -hmm. his very next film. And I think it's at that time... I believe I'm right about this. I believe it's the only film he had he had written from a, his original source material. It's like, you know, Terms of Endearment is adapted from the Larry McMurtry novel. Right. So it was his first sort of real like auteur yes. uh, piece being uh, written and directed by James L. Brooks. Uh, there was a, a featurette that I found online that was just about his career and it covered uh, the TV work on Mary Tyler Moore mm-hmm. and Taxi and Lou Grant 
and then his sort of unusual launch into become you know launch from TV into becoming a big time film director and it covered terms of endearment broadcast news then jumped ahead to as good as it gets and then I guess that was what the producer of the featurette decided was the end of the only the highlights of his career so on the Simpsons he had the Simpsons I wonder if I wanted to look up at her her involvement with Gracie films you know Polly Platt was uh, is someone I've mentioned many times on the podcast and is one of the most intriguing and important women in Hollywood, uh, let alone mm-hmm. figures in Hollywood. But I'm, I'm giving her that the, the, the category of important women in Hollywood just because she was and is an iconic figure amongst would be producers and directors. And she famously always has been mentioned and attached to powerful directorial men. So in the first, she was married to Peter Bogdanovich and co-wrote with him Targets, which I've done on the podcast with Joseph Schneider. That's another great episode, great film, Bogdanovich's first film as a director. And she was the production designer on Last Picture Show. Then, of course, you have this operatic mess with Bogdanovich having an affair with Sybil Shepard during the filming of The Last Picture Show and the breakup of their marriage. Uh, But she continued to work on Bogdanovich products like What's Up Doc and Paper Moon. And I think after a period of, I don't know if she was in the weeds, but post Bogdanovich, she uh, became an executive vice president at Gracie Films, which was James L. Brooks, is James L. Brooks's company. And it look, I'm looking here. It says that she was worked there from 85 to 95. And if we look right. at Jim Brooks's filmography and that sort of drop off, I wonder if there's a correlation. So, for example, the last film that she conceivably could have worked on is As Good As It Gets. Which is what, 97 it's or something? It's 97, but I wonder if she had a role on it. Was um, Jerry Maguire, was that a Gracie Films production? Because I know she worked on that. Jerry Maguire was a Gracie Films production, yes. Okay. What year is Jerry Maguire? And that's probably 95, 96. That's 96. So, yeah. You know, I wonder if post... So, the Gracie Films she co-produced, Broadcast News, some other things that, you know, he didn't direct, War of the Roses, Bottle Rocket, Say Anything. Right. Um, But I wonder, I wonder. And she was uh, art director for uh, Terms of Endearment and won an Oscar. She did. And yeah. fascinating character. I actually just learned. I haven't even had a chance to listen to it. I don't know if people are familiar with the um, the great Hollywood history podcast. You must remember this. Yeah. But she the, did a whole season on Polly. She Platt. did a whole season on Polly Platt. Have you listened to that? I haven't listened to that yet, but I plan to. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty it's it's pretty good. Like I said, uh, she was somebody that I didn't know at all prior to. Um, listening to that podcast, which came out in 2020. Yeah. So it's kind of fascinating, kind of, that you know, Jim Brooks and, and Polly Platt both sound like very strong-willed, creative people. And, um, you know, I wonder, I think it's an open question for all of these directors, for Bogdanovich, too, who really never appreci- uh, approached the level of uh, cinematic quality as he had when he was working in tandem with Polly Platt. And I wonder if maybe a little bit of the same might be true for Jim Brooks and some of his movies. We don't know. But anyway, yeah, coming off of the massive life changing hit that was Terms of Endearment and the torturous kind of four year process of getting the film made, uh, you can listen to our Terms of Endearment episode for a lot of the backstory of things that were going on during the filming, our analysis in that episode of the a double standard that often exists in Hollywood when you have two female co-stars who have difficulty, as Shirley MacLaine and Deborah Winger famously did on that set, and how much ele- how much more elevated that is when it's two women than when it's uh, two men, you know, or even a man and a woman who are having difficulty on a set. There's something in Hollywood that wants to pit women against each other, and I think over inflates what really is the ordinary type of difficulty, stress, conflict, whatever you want to call it, clashing of working styles um, on a film set. So 
Yeah, I, I would also add to that. I wonder if there's an element there of the fact that in terms of endearment that Deborah Winger and uh, Shirley MacLaine were basically two female leads. And if somehow in sort of the psychology of of people um, responding to how movies typically aren't set up with, mm. uh, you know, with two female heterosexual leads. Um, and there might be something in that. And there might be something in, and I just read this great article that um, I sent to you, which I want to just credit um, the writer as I mention it here. It was a Rachel Abramowitz profile of Polly Platt done for Premier Magazine. Remember when Premier Magazine was a thing, Rick? <laughs> Remember when you could buy a magazine it. that had like smart erudite film writing for the masses? Like this was not a cinast magazine. <laughs> this was a popular culture film magazine that had lengthy profiles of people like Polly Platt in 1993. Right. With photos by Mary Ellen Mark. I mean, it's incredible. Great article. I'll put a link to it in the uh, podcast episode description so people can check it out. But in that article, she talks about the fact that the conflict between the Shirley MacLaine character and the Deborah Winger character, I think the phrase that's used is parents who love their children too much. And the conflict that can arise is, at least in the telling of this article, something that Brooks handed over to Polly Platt, sort of like, can you write or make these mother daughter things work in this movie? Because he had other things to be navigating. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I haven't right. read the Larry McMurtry source material, so I don't know how much of that is is already in there. Certainly as constructed in the film, any conflicts that they might've been having are exactly what you want on screen um, with that underlying love, which apparently was not there, but that's why they're actors. They figured that out. So similarly in broadcast news, you know, a lot of the source materials will say things like Brooks writes films without any clearly defined good or bad characters. Like every, mm -hmm. everyone's pretty nuanced. Everyone's pretty human. And I think that's true in broadcast news. And one of the things that I really took away and was shocked again, and this is such a weird experience that, I, that I'm having now, and I guess it's not weird to, you know, watch 147 movies for the podcast and sort of have your ability to watch something change over that time. But I really missed until this time, this this two, three times that I watched the film preparing for this episode. I missed the fact that this is a uh, subversive anti-romantic comedy masquerading as a romantic comedy. I sort of <laughs> presumed it was a romantic comedy take on the news business. Right. Come to find out it's not that at all. I mean, it is that, but it's not. You know, one of the things that's really genius about this, you know, from sort of a, a, a you know, a, a literary level is that you have this, uh, rom-com triangle that is kind of, you know, placed over the chassis of a TV newsroom. Mm -hmm. But it's not as if it's not like you could just take these three characters and have them play out the same thing in a post office. You know what I mean? <laughs> True. Their, their relationships to each other, their faults, the communication strategies, everything about not just them, but even about everybody kind of in the world around them, the workspace around them is they're they're all sort of living a TV reality. And I don't mean that like like a fantasy. I mean it like that they're that they're constantly sort of consumed with how their message is getting across to the other person or what the message is that's getting across to the other person. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard that take. I like that. Uh, you reminded me of, I thought Roger Ebert had some particularly great uh, analyses about this film. I'm going to play a little bit of the Siskel and Ebert review of this that's in a second. But he also said um, that the film is, uh, quote, knowledgeable about the TV news gathering process as any movie ever made. But it also has insights into the more personal matter of how people use high pressure jobs as a way of avoiding time alone with themselves. <laughs> which is well, as, certainly the case in this movie. And it's funny that I completely, I, I think I just missed that in previous viewings or at earlier points in my life. You know, the way in which it's actually pretty audacious for this film to end as it does in the confines of the typical big budget studio romantic comedy. You know, the audience doesn't get what it wants. And 
the characters, it's like Brooks was so focused and had the juice to stay committed to this concept. As he said that this is a movie about three people who've lost their last shots at intimacy. Yeah. And, and he stays true to that. It's funny. He says in some of the making of stuff that he didn't like the characters when he first wrote them. And then he figured he would just fix that later. And then he got to a point in the screenplay where he, he did like them. He was able to find the humanity in them. And he had always thought, I'll just figure out the ending later. And we'll talk, we can talk about how he tried to solve that. And we'll play the alternative ending, which is jarring to watch uh, now that you know how the film does end, which is with nobody getting together um, of the two romantic possibilities. Yeah, not, o- not only that, I mean, you're talking about this as sort of a, uh, a you know, a counter romantic comedy. It's not just that the love triangle doesn't get resolved. I hope I'm not giving you too much away here. You know, there's no sex in this movie. This is a love triangle where nobody where uh, nobody has sex. <laughs> True. There's one there is one scene where William Hurt, uh, you know, has kind of a, uh, a you know, a, a fling with uh, former Bond girl uh, Lois Child. Yes. Who's great, but, by the way. <laughs> she is great. But uh, like I said, there's this is a this is it, when I say no sex, I don't mean it's no sex in a sort of uh, puritanical way. I just mean that it's all of these scenes where characters are sort of getting out of sexual opportunities for one reason or another. What we end up with at the end is uh, a love triangle where not only is there no sex, not only do does the girl not decide which boy she'd rather mm-hmm. be with, but she actually rejects the primary t- target of her mm-hmm. affection because she disagrees with his yes. personal ethics. And do you think... I'm sorry, his professional ethics. His professional ethics. Do you think that the, char- that the character would be better off having gone for the relationship with Tom? Do I think that the character Jane Craig would yes. have been better off going with Tom? Yes. No, because it wouldn't last. See, I think that if you take at face value, as I do... That Brooks is, again, you know, writing a film about three people who lose their last shot at intimacy. I think that the the, that the spark between Jane and Tom was real. I think that what's brilliant about the film and what's original, in a sense, for this type of film, again, for a big budget studio romantic comedy with some movie stars in it. All those scenes that you just referenced where the connection is there and the characters, usually the male character, is unable to act on it or thwarts it in the case of Jane. So you have the the contra firefight taking place and under fire, it's it's sort of this thing that Brooks, you know, had interviewed so many people in the TV news business who told Mm -hmm. him, you know, you, you can't really underestimate the aphrodisiacal quality of being in a war you know, a live fire war moment where you are fully embracing the fact that this is the moment you have. You may not live another hour or another day. And there's a great moment between Aaron and Jane where she's available and wants to kiss him right right there while they're just after the firefight. Right. And Mm -hmm. he he can't do it. He doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. He pulls away out of his fear. And same thing with with Jane and Tom, like she thwarts that through telling it like it is, you know, yeah. Um, and Aaron confessing his love to Jane on and on. Right. So it's the missed connections that are um, put on display. But I think and I, don't, I guess Brooks wouldn't cop to this, doesn't per se cop to it, but it feels to me like the Jane Tom connection is a very real one as presented in the film Mm -hmm. and that it's, it's her personality flaws that prevent that from reaching a fruition, not his, he's available to her. He's the one who tries to say, Hey, let's go out and celebrate. And this, that great scene after he gets that very important opportunity to anchor while the Jack Nicholson, Bill Rorish character is off on his boat which is a nice little allusion to, I believe, Cronkite, who is a huge sailor. Oh, okay. Um, Tom gets to to anchor and does an amazing job with her help. And she won't go out and celebrate with him. 
and he there's this great scene where he just can't he can't believe that she won't follow through on this moment this momentum that's building we just had this great experience everyone's going out why aren't you going to go she doesn't go she goes to Aaron instead mm-hmm. um so to me it kind of feels like they should have been together but she was unable to pull the trigger but maybe that's right just- well and it's not just that to, i would argue it's not just that uh she can't pull the trigger again it's that she has this you know there's also this sort of discourse going on on the sideline of that which is what your standards are and she has she's very mixed up in her hmm. uh, assessment of william hurt's character as far as how she measures him as a as a um, a romantic partner and how she how he measures up to her as a, a you know a person of integrity <laughs> right you catch that part about albert brooks where he's as you said he's comparing william hurt's character to the to the devil devil i've never seen you like this with anybody so don't get me wrong when i tell you that tom while being a very nice guy is the devil this isn't friendship. You're crazy, you know that? What do you think the devil's going to look like if he's around? God. Come on, no one's going to be taken in by a guy with a long red pointy tail. Come on, what's he going to sound like? <laughs> no. I'm semi-serious here. You're serious. He will be attractive. He'll be nice and helpful. He'll get a job where he influences a great God-fearing nation. He'll never do an evil thing. He'll never deliberately hurt a living thing. He'll just bit by little bit lower our standards where they're important. Just a tiny little bit. Just coax along, flash over substance. Just a tiny little bit. And he'll talk about all of us really being salesmen. And he'll get all the great women. Right. But and isn't that what is happening to Holly Hunter, that from the beginning, she has no interest in William Hurt. She thinks him to be a fake. And then the story is the process of her giving in, giving in, giving in, giving in mm-hmm. um, up until the very end where she's going to she's going to go away with him, uh, you know, on this holiday to the Caribbean or something mm-hmm. until Albert Brooks steps in and reveals to her that uh, William Hurt is guilty of this questionable be ethical right. behavior which may not seem like a big deal to him or maybe not even to us as the audience but for holly hunter it's a you know it's a it's a deal breaker it is and i think that that's worthy of discussion because one of the things that i think strikes the modern viewer of this film is how quaint that hang up now seems and how prescient the film was in anticipating the quote unquote news environment that we currently live in, which is so far away from the news that you and I grew up with, even which is not that long ago or even mm-hmm. worked in for that matter. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. I worked in the television news business for two to three years before abandoning it for the, you know, unscripted scripted side of 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 the business. And you worked in the radio and and television uh news business yourself in the same kind of early 90s period that I did. So Mm -hmm. it's funny now to watch the film and realize that, wow, to be to to be considered as the movie considers that turning, you know, your single camera around Mm -hmm. and faking tears in an otherwise impressively put together piece about date rape as as the Tom character uh, has an original idea. Uh, which he is the first to admit is not something that comes naturally to him. And in faking the, well, fake, it's also a gray area, Rick, because, you know, as he says, um, I figured since I almost did it the first time, meaning cried when the woman was telling this very powerful, moving story of Mm -hmm. being attacked by someone she knew, I figured since I almost did it the first time, it wasn't a big deal to, show people how it how it how it almost went down and of course to her that's such an inviolable violation of a journalistic code of ethics which is already over and that's kind of the point the movie is making is that both she and aaron are creatures of a different era who 
uh, in the film have to struggle to either adapt as Jane does. She does adapt. And when the little coda section where we meet them seven years later, you know, she's still in the business and she's going to become the managing editor of the nightly news. So she's she's figured out a way to survive. Aaron has not. The Albert Brooks character, um, he's been he, he walked away. And of course, Tom is ascendant. He's now the new Bill Rorish. He's the nightly news anchor. And so, again, that's more fodder for me to say, like, well, they why couldn't they have been together? Because they both adapted and they both survived and thrived um, and they could have been a news power couple, but that wasn't the way the film ended. It was a, a bridge too far for a Holly Hunter's character. And as you said, the the stunt with the fake tear, thinking that a, that a reporter by today's standards could get fired mm -hmm. uh, for doing something like that is, um, is unimaginable. <laughs> it is. It's part of, uh, it's part of what's great. And you know, I think Brooks mentioned somewhere that he feels that it's great when a movie can capture a moment in time. And he's he's proud that he did that with broadcast news. And I think that's part of what what I respond to is he gets right so many things about the camaraderie of that environment, about the kind of there's a hierarchy. But in a way, there isn't like there's a, you're all on the same team. You're aware of who is who's every what what everyone's role is. But I think he does such a great job in the newsroom of capturing those moments when there's banter, they're standing around, there's smart people engaged with the world around them and competent people, uh, complicated people, messy people. I mean, that, that's what's great about the TV business, about the TV news business, particularly. And it's also what could be maddening and frustrating about it. Mm -hmm. So his research pointedly involved Susan Zarinsky, who's a, another sort of CBS News legendary producer, executive, very beloved within the, the TV news industry. And she's often cited as the character inspiration for uh, Holly Hunter. One, one, one element that was really interesting, what Brooks did, and it'll be very clear in the film. Um, I went to, it was all shot in Washington, and we shot overnight. I would be on set overnight and then go back to work in the morning, because it was during Iran-Contra, and I didn't want to really want to miss this amazing story. But I went out to L.A. for about two weeks, and I had learned to edit film at American University. And so I had my own steam back there. And my job when I went out there at the end was to write background dialogue for continuity. Because if, if the anchor was going down, well, well, where was his copy? And there was real news value in writing the lines for the background players that you wouldn't even see, but it would be off-camera lines for authenticity and for continuity. He went to extreme lengths to make it accurate. I think that there's more in, in that character than just Susan Zerinsky. I'm not sure it's quite that simple because I know Brooks did a lot of research and he won't mention the woman that he met at, I think the 1984 political, uh, maybe de 1984 Democratic Convention, but he met a woman who was a White House correspondent for one of the major networks who told Brooks that she was involved in a, two, a relationship with two different guys and and wasn't sure mm -hmm. which one was going to work out or not. But he's, he's never named who that was. Um, but his impressive research, I think, lends this. Hate to use this FCAC overused word, verisimilitude to all mm. of the news gathering stuff that we see. And if anyone has worked in the news or you know, worked in a TV show environment, I think you're going to find a lot to appreciate about how well done that aspect of the film is. Do you agree? I agree with that. And I think even for people who um, don't know a lot about uh, TV news necessarily or uh, television production, you know, there is, it's a, because it's such a heavily character driven piece and the characters are both flawed and likable that I think there's something here for it even for people who may not necessarily be interested in the all the sort of behind the scenes stuff behind the scenes as far as the production of tv news if there's people who, who think that that's not their bag there is the romantic comedy and so that i think that's what part of what made this uh such a successful movie at the time it came out is that um it's uh you know i think that it can 
appeal to a pretty broad audience, but it also treats the the audience intelligently. Well, success wise, it certainly didn't match the terms of endearment, which I guess is more of a pop culture juggernaut film. Um, But on a budget of 15 million, Broadcast News made sixty seven million dollars compared to the hundred and sixty five million dollars of terms Mm. of endearment. But, you know, hey, sixty seven million and I think seven Oscar nominations is is still pretty good. It's still prestige mainstream cinema for its time. It was nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor, Holly Hunter for Best Actress, Albert Brooks for Best Supporting Actor, Best Screenplay, Best Cinematography, and Best Film Editing. So uh, didn't win Mm -hmm. any of those. It came out in a year when other pictures were Wall Street, Spielberg's Empire of the Sun, Danny DeVito, another taxi alumnus, uh, Throw Mama from the Train, and your personal favorite, Barbara Streisand's Nuts. <laughs> uh, Christmas wait, what 1987. Was best, what was Best Picture? Is that the last Emperor year? Um, I think it was. Let's see. The Last Emperor. Because, yeah. Wait, no, not Last Emperor. Just, uh, Sorry. Not Last no. Emperor. Empire of the Sun. Empire Sorry. of the Sun was the best picture. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that. I'm Googling it. Oh, uh, no. I was just thinking that, that also Last Emperor was in the mix, but that may have been the year before or after. Let's see. Best picture, 1987. You'd think a podcast about talking about this would have its shit together, but that's where well, you, that's yeah, where I wish I had pulled it up. So this on, is actually going to be maybe Oscars of '88. Oh. Let's see. You know how we always that's get so confusing. About- and we get this is another thing I hate about the Oscars. Figure this shit out, okay? Okay. Best Picture was Last Emperor, and the uh, okay. other nominees: Fatal Attraction, Hope and Glory. Was that the same year? No, no, no you're in the wrong. The you're in the wrong year. You're in the oh, wrong it says year. Best Academy Award, Best Picture nominees, 1988. And is what else is in there? Well, uh, let's see. Is broadcast uh, news I mean, in I there? I just sort of Googled it. Is, 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 is broadcast news in that list? Yeah. Oh, okay. Last Emperor, Fatal Attraction, Hope and Glory, Moon, Moonstruck, Broadcast News. Okay. So that's the 88 or the 87 Oscars? Well, according to Google, <laughs> they're calling it nominees for 1988. You know, so those would be pictures that... You know what the Academy would have us do? Qualified in 1987. The Academy would say, hey, idiots. What's that? Refer to it as the 60th Academy Awards and avoid the fact that the telecast takes place the year following the films released. Uh-huh. So it's the, it, the telecast takes place in 1988. Yeah. It's rewarding films released in 1987. And the way That's, around that, and I guess from this point forward, okay. I'm going to try to train myself to do this, is just to say, in the 60th Academy Awards, and you are correct, best picture. Yeah, but nobody knows what that, what, what uh, that I, is. You got to say the but, year. Yeah, but if you say the year, if you say the 1988 Academy Awards... Isn't it, is, yeah. you're presuming that everyone's going to know you're talking about movies that were released in 1987. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, it didn't go wrong until I tried to Google it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because if you Google 19, 1987, well, yeah, then you're going to get, you're yeah. going to get all the wrong shit. So, um, yeah. So best picture was the last emperor and Bertolucci won for director best actor. This is kind of crazy. Uh, Your best actor nominees in this year were Michael Douglas as Gordon Gekko for Wall Street, William Hurt as Tom Grunick in Broadcast News, Marcello Mastroianni in Dark Eyes, never heard of that, Jack Nicholson in Ironweed, and Robin Williams in Good Mm. Morning Vietnam. Mm. Now, if I look at all of those as acting performances, I haven't seen Dark Eyes, but I've seen all the others. Um, I understand why William Hurt didn't win. Because Michael Douglas has the showier, more of the era performance, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But in terms of acting, there's just no cat. There's no question that William Hurt is the best actor, and this is this, the best actor in the best acting performance in a film of these five or six nominees. Same thing, best actress. 
Cher and Moonstruck. Okay. Kind of hard to argue with that. Loretta Castorini did a great Moonstruck episode on the pod. If people haven't listened to it, Glenn Close and Fatal Attraction, Holly Hunter, Sally Kirkland in Anna. Never heard of that either. And Meryl Streep. And I guess I Ironweed that. was a very well-regarded film. Meryl Streep was nominated. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was Holly Hunter's kind of first real dramatic role. Her previous role and a film that I experienced in real time uh, was her great turn in the Coen Brothers film Raising Arizona opposite Nick Cage. That was kind of her right. first big feature film role. Which one you get? I don't know. Nathan Jr., I think. Give me here. Here's the instructions. Oh, he's beautiful. Yeah, he's awful damn good. I think I got the best one. I bet they were all beautiful. All babies are beautiful. This one's awful damn good, though. Don't you cuss around him. He's fine, he is. I think it's Nathan Jr. We are doing the right thing, aren't we, Hi? I mean, they had more than they could handle. Well, now, honey, we've been over this and over this, and there's what's right, and there's what's right, and never the twain shall meet. But don't you think his mama will be upset? I mean, overly? Well, of course she'll be upset, sugar, but she'll get over it. She's got four little babies, almost as good as this one. It's like when I was robbing convenience stores. <laughs> I love him so much. I know you do, honey. I love him so much. I know you do. Of course, that's a comedy. I think it was her first. Yeah. I think it was her first feature film. Role. Maybe it's her very first feature film role. And yeah. uh, that's a comedy, and it's also very broadly pitched. So there's not a lot of opportunity for the type of emotional depth that she gets to do in broadcast news. So it is a pretty big jump for her as an actor and as a relative unknown to get this role and to knock it out of the park as well as she did. I mean, the three of them together are so good in so many different ways. It's such a it's just a testament to the luck, I guess, that comes together that people are available at the same time. And uh, I think that he, Brooks cast her extremely late in the process and had looked at some other uh, actors in. Put that one back. Had the opportunity to play my alternative casting sound drop. So I'm going to do that. I always love that. Was, wasn't this role written for Deborah Winger? That's what, that's what, I, yes, that's what, it, that's what it says. Uh, written for Deborah Winger, who worked obviously in terms of endearment, but became pregnant and was replaced by Holly Hunter just two days before filming began. That's don't know about that. I didn't read that in a lot of the making of, but that's a great story. Let's go with it. Others who were considered Sigourney Weaver, Diane Wiest, Jessica Lange, Elizabeth Perkins and Mary Beth Hurt, the, I believe, contemporary Mrs. Bill Hurt at the time, unless they were already divorced by then. Yeah, uh, yeah. So they divorced around 84. Hmm. OK, so maybe that was part of the part of the consideration. And uh, the Aaron Altman role was specifically- why she didn't get the. Yeah, why okay. she didn't get the role, I don't know. But the Aaron Altman role was written specifically by Brooks for his friend. Albert Brooks and and, and uh, James Brooks said that he stalled production for six months to wait for Bill Hurt to become available. Right. So which... so the men were sort of were chosen early. And then Holly Hunter, as you said, uh, was a sort of a, a last minute uh, casting, but one that all parties seem to agree was uh, um, uh, great luck. And I want to play a little bit of um, Jim Brooks talking about the inspiration for Hertz characters. And we'll talk a little bit about these three main performances and play a little of them. But here's here's Jim Brooks talking about the origin of the Tom Grunick um, character. And there was a guy on a CBS news show that was kissing show business for the first time that was on that show. And everybody in the news department made fun of him. And everybody, you know, he was a good looking guy and he had, he, he had not paid the dues that everybody else had paid. And I interviewed him and, and it was the best thing I could have, that could have happened to me because he was aware that he was the butt of jokes and suddenly he became sympathetic to me and that and I think if I hadn't met him I would have written the character in a much more two-dimensional way isn't that such a cool I, I just love that because it, it talks about I think the commitment that Brooks had towards bringing this realism to his characterizations and 
you know, not a lot of writers give so much credit to other things than their own brilliance in creating characters. But I think Jim Brooks, and certainly talking about this movie particularly, is always very careful to indicate that, you know, he didn't come up with every single idea here. He's just good at marshalling the good ideas. And man, watching this film again, and maybe it's because, well, you know, William Hurt has passed away more recently than not. And so you have that wave of kind of reconsideration of the complexity of the man and, the, and all the different filmic work that he did. And Brooks said of William Hurt, I don't think any actor has done what William Hurt did in this movie. And I completely agree. I think that if any other kind of 80s pretty boy, you know, like a Richard Gere had played this part, it, it wouldn't be a tenth of what William Hurt was able to, co to convey here, which is so, again, distinctively unique and deceptively so. He never breaks the character as the good looking guy who knows he's kind of dumb. He, he never out, he never outgrows that, you know, um, and I think that's a testament to honoring the character in a way that's very atypical of a big romantic comedy movie where, you know, you, you're supposed to have in quotes this resolution where everyone becomes who we hoped they might be. And this film stays true to the bitter end. Uh, up to and including, I think, the very apparent mismatch between Tom and his eventual wife, his fiance, as he introduces her to uh, Aaron and Jane. Right. Like that scene is played very specifically for a level of discomfort between those two. And I think that's continuing to make the same point that we were talking about earlier, which is that these people are still flawed and incapable of intimacy and managing their personal lives, even as yeah. their careers flourish and take off. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't, they're not evil people. They're not, he's not really the devil, <laughs> but yeah, they do reach a point. Each, each of these characters do sort of like reach a climax of their adulthood in which they're not going to really grow or change uh, in character uh, anymore. And I think that William Hurt is, so phenomenal at, I think it's, it's famously, you know, what's it, what it's difficult to play drunk convincingly. And it's, and it's supposedly <laughs> difficult to play dumb when you're not right. Or people who make a career out of being dumb actually have, you know, more going on in order to do that than we might think. So you could take like Joey from friends, right. But then Matt LeBlanc kind of plays himself in such a smart send up way in later television series work that kind of shows you that there's, you know, there's more to uh, the man perhaps than the part, but William Hurt here, man, it, it's just uh, all of them, but particularly I would say, uh, I mean, Albert Brooks, and, and I'm not slagging off Albert Brooks. I just, I love Albert Brooks. I love all Albert Brooks films. He's consistently hilarious. He's interesting. He's great in this film, but he doesn't get to have as much of the emotional range that, uh, Bill Hurt and Holly Hunter do be just because they're the two main protagonists. They have a bit more to do, although he does have this thwarted love thing and he plays that very well and very uniquely. Mm -hmm. But man, William Hurt, I'm just, I think he, I think it's a masterclass. I think it's an incredible performance to watch the subtleties and the nuances of. Mm -hmm. And he is the butt of jokes, but he also isn't just, um, you know, I think of the scene where Aaron, yeah, who's, who, who, who is an asshole, right? He's a, he's a pretentious asshole and he's, he's mad and he grills, he puts Tom on the spot outside the, I don't know, with the Italian embassy dinner or the correspondence thing where he, he says, you know, can you name all the members of the cabinet? And, you know, <laughs> Tom's like, oh, come on, I'm not going to get into that. Like if it came up in conversation and he says, oh, we're having a conversation. Oh, hey, I forgot the names of the members of the cabinet. Do you happen to know them? And he's, and, you know, he's kind of walking, you know, Tom Grunick's walking away and he's kind of like, yeah, I do know them. And Brooks says all 12. And Tom says, yes, all 12. He goes, there's only 10. Uh, mm -hmm. And then as he exits, the uh, Albert Brooks character says, hey, stick around. Where are you going? We're going to do state capitals next. And I think this is the genius of the screenplay and the performer. 
William Hurt pulls off this line as he goes through the door when Aaron says state capitals and Grunick says 50, right? And it's like he's in on the joke that's on himself. And William Hurt pulls that mm-hmm. off. I think that's really, really hard to do as an actor. You know, um, he's not playing one well, thing. Right. Well, part of it, too, is that yeah, he is, manipulates people and situations to get what he wants using his looks as sort of like a tool. But the fact is, he's not quite, he's not really a vain no, person. not at all. His, his problem is, isn't vanity. His problem is laziness. That he's an intellectually lazy person uh, who who s- seeks shortcuts. Um, that's the, that's why. I don't think uh, that's. I don't think that's uh, fair. reprehensible. I don't think what? that's fair. I think you're taking the Jane definition of Tom Grunick a little too at face value. That's her. That's her criticism of him directly in that scene. That you're the, the wrong first, with her. Okay, you're with her. I mean, she says to him, "Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you apply mm-hmm. yourself?" I think what 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 I think William Hurt conveys so uh, intelligently, ironically is that he's completely aware that it, studying is not going to help him. His brain doesn't work that way. He doesn't retain that information. He's aware, and I actually think he accurately represents a real truth. Like, there's the, it, we'll, we'll play the alternative ending because it's really the only time that this thing that I'm about to say gets said, and, and it's the Tom Grunick character that says it, which is like, you know, he's, it's basically like a version of the Fredo speech where he's like, you know, I'm good at stuff, too. And what he's basically saying is, you know, I'm really fucking good at this. And being good at this is more important than knowing the members of the cabinet. And he's right when it comes to delivering the news. He's one thousand mm-hmm. percent right. It always has been that way. Right. It is. It's an entertainment job. It is a it's it's acting. It is performing the news on camera it's embodying a trustworthiness and a gravitas but you don't have to actually have the intellectual background in order to embodiment uh, embody that all you have to do is look at the great example of peter jennings right he never went to college Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yet he would be considered in his heyday one of the most one of the smartest most well-educated men uh in the television news business right you know, from the radio business, TV business, it's the same thing. It's like, it's kind of the land of misfit toys, right? And people bounce around and have these voices that are the conveyance medium for the information. And so I think more charitably to the Tom Grunick character, you know, I think he's right to be aware of his skills and abilities, just as he's right to be aware that he doesn't have, you know, Something that, let's be honest, do you think that the Jack Nicholson, Bill Roarsh character is supposed to be some intellectual mastermind as presented? Like, (laughs) I'm not sure that's the case either. Right. So I think it's a little unfair for you to take her side. Yeah, well, I think that uh, Jack Nicholson's character is supposed to be sort of the the model that you're sort of looking into the future to see the the direction that William Hurt is is, uh, headed for. There's a great scene when they finally meet. And and Brooks brilliantly films the handshake. Mm -hmm. And what's so great about it is here are these two. You know, one guy is the alpha in Nicholson and the other guy is ascendant in in the Tom Grunick character. And they they shake hands and they both release the handshake at exactly the same moment so that neither has the upper hand in such a great little (laughs) piece of machismo. This is so funny. Um, Right. So Uh, I also just want to add to your uh, your. uh... Um, your comments from a minute ago that um, I worked in news radio in both New York and Denver. And I think people would be surprised how many on air on radio, on air people have ponytails. Men. <laughs> exactly my point. Yeah. And, and people, you know, you know, people that you wouldn't expect to have ponytails, you know, yeah. and not in a conspiracy thing, like the uh, great, what's the ESPN host, the NFL guy, John, um, I got well, uh, yeah, I know you're talking about. I can't think of his last name. You know, there's a whole thing like people had photos and uh, thought that they, you know, that he had a ponytail. It was funny. But yeah, you're right. It's it was an urban myth. It was an urban myth. Yes. Um, So I think um, I can't say enough about 
William Hurt and and his ability to do something that I, I can't think of any other actor that I would just echo what Brooke said. I don't think any actor has done what William Hurt did in this movie. I think it's so good as to be deceptively easy to digest. And when you watch the film again, if you're inspired to do so, but I'm listening to this, just watch him. Like he's so um, he's so varied and uh, contains so many both straightforward emotions that he's able to communicate and many that he's not. There's a hilarious scene I love when she has that scene with Jennifer where uh, two female colleagues, one is asking the other for permission to date the new guy. Basically, that's what Jennifer is asking uh, Jane. Mm -hmm. And this is a great scene where Jane's, she's like, you know, I just want to ask you if you mind. And Jane's like, "Uh," she kind of has this dawning, like, I do mind. Oh, shit. How can I, how can I mind? And when she then looks for uh, Tom, there's this brilliant cutaway (laughs) that Brooke stages where Tom is trying to eat a deviled egg at the party. <laughs> it's so fucking good. He just fumbles a deviled egg. And it's it's the most perfect cutaway to the character. Oh my God, I, re- I re- mm-hmm. rewound that several times and watched it because it was just, it perfectly encapsulates the strange affinity that she feels for him. And I think mm-hmm. the, the way he's not just a preening narcissist at all. You know, mm-hmm. people that are great broadcasters there's a thing they have, just like anyone who's a great actor, just like anyone, you know, there's a reason Tom Brokaw, Peter Jennings. Um, who's the crazy one from CBS? What's the uh, Dan Rather? Dan Rather. Dan Rather. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, they had something. Who's the crazy one? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dan. But, you know, crazy in a good way. Uh-huh. But, I mean, those three... You know, I, we, 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 have, we have no anchors equivalent to that anymore. What was rewarded was uh, an idealized sense of what a journalist's responsibilities were and that these white men on TV were, you know, projecting, like I said, an, an, an idealized uh, professionalism hmm. and a certain amount of integrity and character, no matter what was going on in their private lives. Mm-hmm. And now... What's idealized is opinion. Now That's true. the heroes are are the the heroes are the people who have um, the hottest takes have brought together. <laughs> yeah, had brought together um, in the most significant audiences that uh, conform to their opinion, whether that be you know uh, Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow. Who are yeah, and and you raise a good point because Tucker Carlson and Rachel Maddow are the same person on different sides of the political coin and don't anyone be fooled otherwise. I think it's very convenient for people on the left to say of the Tucker Carlson's of the world, oh my God, what a travesty. But I think people on the left need to remember that they, we have our own version of that. And it's all Mm -hmm. over the place, especially on MSNBC. CNN, they're trying to get away from that apparently, but yes, I think that's a very good point. And I think also, and it's, it's alluded to in the film, that there's a system that existed then, you know, it's a great scene when the layoffs come and Tom Grunick is, is in his mind demoted from the Washington bureau and is being sent to London. And he has this great scene with, with Albert Brooks, where Aaron goes, wait, that's a promotion. And Tom's like, Oh, I don't think so. He's like, Oh my God, they're grooming you for the whole thing. And you don't even know it. And I think whether it's Brokaw, <laughs> Jennings, Dan Rather, they all were part of that system where you did this and then you did that. You went to Washington, then you were in the London Bureau. You had this experience and contacts. And when you were ready, when they were ready for you, when the guy ahead of you, when the old white guy ahead of you was finished in his time, then you ascended to the chair. And <laughs> that star making system just doesn't exist anymore. And probably for the best, but it would be an interesting question that I think people do wrestle with. You know, I certainly miss being able to trust the news. I remember that as a kid. And I'm not saying that the news didn't have bias then. But when you watch, as I have occasion to do, old network news packages from the 70s or the 80s, you know, it's way more straightforward than what you get now. It's it's pretty much the news. (laughs) You know, I mean, the way the news is shown in broadcast news. Here's the story. Here's the things that happened. And that's all gone now. You know, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, a nightly network nightly news is still on. I don't watch it. You might watch it, but no, 
you know, it's, um, yeah, it's just, it captures this moment that is gone um, and does it so incredibly well. I also wanted to mention, um, what's the character? I didn't know this until digging in, but the brilliant uh, news director is played by Peter Hackis, Paul Moore, who I just yeah. thought was, a, I just assumed was, a, was one of those great that guy character actors, but it turns out he's a 30 year NBC News veteran. Yeah. Who was let go in the era of um, looking for pretty boys. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to play a little of he was actually one of the first reporters for NBC News. At the JFK assassination. This is NBC News. Here is Peter Hackis in Washington. President Kennedy has been shot. As of now, there is no final official report on his condition. Here now, piece together the news items we have as they have reached us from Dallas, Texas. Within the hour, President Kennedy and Texas Governor John B. Connolly were cut down by would-be assassins' bullets as they toured downtown Dallas in an open automobile. Representative Albert Thomas, Democrat of Texas, says he's been informed the president and Governor Connolly were both still alive after having been shot in an assassination attempt. That's Peter Hackis in the November 22nd, 1963, of course, on NBC Radio News. Mm-hmm. And he would have a 30 year career at NBC before, ironically, being let go because he had the voice, but he didn't have the looks. But he does such a brilliant job uh, portraying this part of the news business and I think embodying the, you know, that part of, you know, he's in the control room. Wasn't Tom great? No one wants to hear it. Right. Um, (laughs) He's, he's thinking about the future and he's thinking about making a star and he's looking beyond Nicholson's Bill Rorish character, but no one else in the film does, you know, no one else is interested, including Bob Prosky's great uh, executive producer of the nightly news. So I just think it's such a cool thing that he was a news lifer and um, also is in this, my favorite line. Now, if there's anything I can do for you, but I certainly hope you'll die soon. (laughs) That's straight out of network. That that is is uh, one of the greatest lines. uh, That's uh, no, it's not the exact, it's not an exact line from network, but it has, it's got uh, Chayefsky. uh, Yes dark uh darkness to it and that's peter peter hackis is the per- person here speaking first who's sort of um, glibly offering the types of meaningless condolences that he doesn't really mean to a laid off news lifer as the axe falls in the newsroom and i just think i certainly hope you'll die soon as a fan of screenwriting you know there are so many brilliant great one-liners uh in this film and there's also so many great visual jokes in the film i love the moment where uh, Albert Brooks in one of the first newsroom scenes where we meet him has a little piece of red fuzz on his uh, shirt and he notices it and in a persnickety way flicks it off of him. It's such a small, <clears throat> tiny little character thing that's so well done. And I think their friendship must have allowed Jim Brooks to write perfectly calibrated scenes for Albert Brooks because he's so funny. He gets a lot of great moments mm. uh, when he's drinking and listening to music at his home. It's just so funny. <laughs> Um, you know, the scene where <laughs> the scene where Prosky introduces his daughter to Tom after Tom had hosted the news for the first time. And mm-hmm. Prosky brings this um, sort of geekily awkward. Uh, it looks like, you know, late teenage daughter who said she wanted to meet Tom Grunick. It's actually Jim Brooks's mm-hmm. daughter uh, is is cast in the part. And she's all embarrassed and shy. And he says, oh, you should be honored, Tom. She's never wanted to meet anyone. And Aaron comes up out of his egocentric uh, narcissism and and says to her, like, hey, uh, Ella, do you you remember me, Uh, Aaron? And she's like, no. And the Prosky character goes, sure, you remember him. He came on that 14 day raft trip with us just last (laughs) year. That is the greatest line. How could you forget a person that was on a rafting trip with you last year for 14 days? And she has no idea who he is. It's so uh, because good. he was wearing the yellow hood, <laughs> yellow rate slicker <laughs> and your hair is different. Oh, my God. It's 
it's so so well written. And Holly Hunter, man, you know, th- what a unique and, and I don't want to say strange, but so different from the time, don't you think? Like, it's just striking to me now. Of course, now we know she's a great actor, but that was not known then. Mm-hmm. And I think it's pretty bold. And again, the business of Hollywood, I think he gets to do this. He gets to cast her because he's Jim Brooks coming off a $165 million hit in terms of endearment. Mm-hmm. You know, at a different point in his career, he maybe doesn't get to cast Holly Hunter. And then a lot of her career maybe doesn't happen the same way, or maybe it's another role that allows her to do the things that she did here. But she's extraordinary in this too, don't you think? Or do you not think? I think she's extraordinary uh, as, uh, I think her performance is extraordinary. I also think it's interesting that her character, you know, if you, if you, if you think of this in terms of, feminism and Mm -hmm. the uh the growth of female characters Mm -hmm. if you kind of if we start at the mary tyler moore show end of jim jim brooks's career where mary is a young girl who's trying to make it into broadcasting and there are all these middle-aged white men who are always judging making judgments about her uh decisions and what her what her role is as a as a female Mm mm-hmm And then we roll ahead here to 1987 and Holly Hunter's character. She's fighting a lot. She's fighting a lot of battles, but she's never really fighting a battle against sexism. No, she's not. And she's not the subject of it either, really, in the film. No one calls her little lady or disparages her, you know, and Uh which I find true to at least my experience in newsrooms in in the early 90s. You know, I, I wouldn't. I mean, of course, the irony is what was going on behind the scenes, which many of us knew about working at places like MSNBC, uh-huh. was all of the Me Too power dynamic abuse of power stuff that we now know was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the workplace, the work, you know, the people who had the jobs, I mean, many of the if I thought of the the most capable and competent people that I worked with when I worked in the, the TV news business, they're all women. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's just like the amount of executive producers and senior producers and coordinating producers, you know, women had their shit together. They're collaborative team players. They're smart. Um, really the men were more in the peacocky positions of, you know, maybe the political game positions, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or the anchor positions. So, yeah, I was struck by that, too. You know, it, it seems like such an obvious thing to give her character a, be to be weighted down by obvious workplace sexism. But I think Brooks was kind of making a point that of all the people that he talked to, yeah, they'd probably dealt with it and experienced it. And maybe they'd had complicated interpersonal relationships with each other. But, you know, she's respected first and foremost. Mm-hmm. I wanted to play a little of the brilliant um that brilliant clip the british foreign not this one oh and albert Albert brooks having the attack of the flop sweats is one of the great scenes it's very funny um in the summer this scene here i wanted to play suddenly attacked two american a little of her nice change New copy, Jane, for just a minute, then we're going to go to Martin Clinic State for the message. You're going to hear Peter Hackett come in at the end of this. Pilot from the Sidra in time to... What? No, you missed him. We only have 10 minutes left. How can you talk to me about parking problems? No, not your try. You'll do it. Do it. Or I'll fry your fat ass as still. Goodbye. I had no idea she was this good. <laughs> That's just one of the <laughs> iconic lines of the film. And that's what gets rewarded, frankly, in the live nightly news business, right? You don't have any time for, you know, you can lose your shit in operatic ways and everyone understands it's just part of the business. Yeah. Nobody takes it personally. So, yeah, I think she, I think Jim Brooks has always written pretty amazingly uh, rich and layered female characters and, and maybe more so than some of his male characters, but man, what an incredible, credible performance from her. Um, and just the mm-hmm. three of them together, just, just to give you something that you can't get. I also wanted to play you this, the theme guys. Oh, uh, Mark Shamian. And yes, because uh, the guys are doing the, the, uh, they're, uh, demonstrating their, uh, 
their uh, news theme? Yes, here it is here. I know you're a musical theater nerd, so. It uh-huh. starts off with this very high-tech synthosequency type thing, like this. That's the news. Shaman doing the bass lines is so good. Big finish. I got you. It's such a nice touch because it, it has. <laughs> It's that's what I don't know a minute and a half long. It has absolutely nothing to do yes. with the rest of the movie, <laughs> but it also it just it's just a, a moment of atmosphere. Well, it also sets up I think an important thing, which is there is a pomposity to the night network nightly news, and I think yeah. this scene goes the other way in demonstrating the self seriousness because to have a theme that b- overblown and dramatically filled with melodies and counter melodies. And as they both say in unison, big finish, it, it kind of is just a, a smart way to do that, um, which mm-hmm. I think is hilarious. I wanted to, uh, let's play a little of the Siskel and Ebert review here because I, I love what they say. Holly Hunter is someone to remember for Oscar time. Broadcast news is a fine, funny, and incisive movie. I think it's terrific. I agree with what you said. I'd also add subtle. One of the things I like about this love triangle you described yes. is how much it is like what happens in real life. In the movie, so often a love triangle is he loves her, yes, I know but you know, da, 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 da. here it's all three of them love their jobs more than even than they love themselves. That's right. All three of them have invested their entire egos in being on the air or behind the scenes and making television. Mm-hmm. And to them, the job is much more important than making private time to have anything to do with each other so that all of their, the love triangle is kind of unrealized opportunities in each direction. That's very subtle and very interesting. And lifelike. Yes. When yes. You, it, see, it, it, it's amazing that you have to use the word subtle to describe lifelike. And the only uh-huh. reason you have to do it is that most movies aren't well written as James Brooks wrote this film. And that goes back to Turns of Endearment 2, where this guy is writing about a relationship between a mother and a daughter. Right. This man knows how to write about people. And another thing he knows how to do is write a screenplay. And one of the things that I like about this screenplay and about the screenplay for Wall Street was that both movies take an area of expertise that involves a lot of technical information, a lot of words for things, a lot of the way people do things, Mm -hmm. and makes it very clear. You do not have to know anything about television to understand what's going on in this movie, and yet the movie itself knows a great deal about television. And if you know a lot about television, you'll still like the movie, which proves that he is really good. Now, one thing else I want to bring up, a lot of people are going to compare this movie to Network. It seemed to me that it was about 10 times more sophisticated than Network in terms of what it understood about television yeah rick i want yeah. your take on that that's a hot take from roger ebert and when he first said it and i first watched it i thought what he's crazy and then my mm-hmm. second thought was holy shit he's right mm, i think you're both crazy <laughs> <I> think- <laughs> so you don't think that broadcast news is 10 times as perceptive about the news business as network Uh, I don't. Um, I think that broadcast news is uh, very perceptive about um, in a way that network isn't. Broadcast news is very uh, perceptive about uh, human behavior and the human condition. Um, They're really very different uh, movies in the way that um, when you look at network, the movie, the people are pretty broadly drawn uh mm-hmm. even the even the characters mm-hmm. like uh Faye Dunaway yeah. and William Holden's characters who are supposed to be the ones with emotional depth right. um are kind of uh play acting in their and the role mm-hmm. roles in that movie and these characters in broadcast news are more genuine layered people mm-hmm. um i think uh broadcast news is a really great um character piece i think that network that uh, the movie network is a uh, because i enjoy the cynicism so much yeah i think it's a uh, uh to me it's a much more it's much more of a, a critique of the news business whereas broadcast news is more about a time in the life of these professional people yeah i mean i guess you know network is much more a straight up satire so as you as you yeah. point out the performances are a bit broader and it doesn't have as quite of a fine tooth comb or appreciation for the 
the mechanics of making television, which broadcast news does. Yeah, all I'll of give the, them that. All of the, you know, even though the scenes are played for comedy, when when um, when Jane is editing with Bobby, the put upon editor, and shouting at him hilariously, "Give me a two second dissolve, Bobby." You know, like all the mechanics of what he's doing and how they're putting it together are spot on and true. Like the, it's a it's a documentary like approach to the making of television in that way that network doesn't really concern itself with that because it's concerned, as you point out, so so well with much bigger things. But man, I loved. Uh, I just loved that Roger Ebert said that because uh, it was a hot take, you know, and it and it kind of <laughs> blew me off my perch here for a minute. And I was like, I reflexively was like, that's ridiculous. Network is, mm -hmm. of course, you know, this cinematic masterpiece. And it is. Uh, but I think I'm going to go with Roger on this one because I do think that it has more gears and more layers. Now, one thing I wanted to play for you and for the people, I don't know if you've seen this yet. This is the alternative ending um, that James, that Jim Brooks uh, kind of talked himself into trying because as he got to the end of the film, as he tells it, he wasn't quite sure how it was going to end, who she was going to end up with. I had this idea that the only way to do a romantic triangle was to really be open to, to either guy getting the girl. You know, that, that you know, every, every romantic triangle you ever saw, it was sort of preordained who you should root for and who should get the girl, and you waited till that happened. And I, and I left that open. I told the actors I was open to either one of them getting the girl. And so that, that means that you're playing every scene. I'll, I, it was such a great time. You're, you're playing every scene without having to have that result. The result of the scene must be that you like this person more. You, so, so it just made the work so much more interesting for everybody, for all of us. And then as we get, and then we got towards the end, I couldn't put her with any guy. And you, you don't want to end a romantic comedy that way, you know, preferably. But I couldn't do it. Uh, so I didn't. And then foreseeably, when you go out and you, have, and you have testing, people weren't even sure which one they wanted her with, but they wanted her with somebody. So this is a, this is a long story. So I, had a, so I had an idea. There was, a, there was a French film, A Man and a Woman, that had a wonderful emotional ending where she gets off the train, and I forget what the story was, but they weren't going to happen, and she suddenly sees him, and the scene really gets you. And then I read that the director had not told her when she got off the train that he would be there, or vice versa. I said, boy, that's so cool. And so I try to set it up with retakes. I told him we need a technical retake for Polly leaving the airport in the cab at the end of the evening, after they, after they were over, leaving, leaving, leaving the airport with a cab. And, I, and my joke, my, not my joke, I was trying to emulate that French experience because at the last minute I was going to put Bill Hurt in the cab with her, in character, that he came back, knowing that they were each good at improvisation and seeing what would happen. And maybe I'd get just a juicy ending. And then just before Bill got it, and you know what, for a movie company to set up something like this, to be at LAX, it was like a big deal. And just before Bill got in the car, so somebody said, Hey, Bill, one of the members on the crew, and, and it was over. And I went out of body. I think we filmed something, but, you know, but that meant that I, I, I went with the original ending, which just projected them into the future and showed how, you know, and I think, I think it was, and then I saw the picture two years after I made it, and I figured with the ending I had, what the picture was really about was three people who lost their last shot at real intimacy. Which sort of made, which I had never intended when I wrote it, but you know, it's a team sport, and a film can means, you know, if you work in a, in a great way, you know, and we we had great people who worked in a great way on that picture, you know, you, you can end up having your film be about something you never imagined. So I don't know how much of what we're about to see here was scripted, because to hear James Brooks tell it, it sounded like a lot of it was improvised, and this scene does go on far too long. It doesn't have the rhythm of a written scene. And so a lot of this, I'm going to cut it off sort of at a point where much of the action is more just like physical stuff, whether they're looking at each other or maybe kissing or maybe not kissing. But I think Bill Hurt gives voice here to a lot of the stuff we've been talking about in his characterization. You keep coming after me and then looking down on me and starting to drive me batty. I can't help it that they like me and I like it that they like me. And I think there's a lot of this job that I do well. 
What do you think it takes to do this job the way they have it now? What, wait a minute. Are you, are you, are you, are you going into town with me? Or are you waiting what for What are you talking flight? about? The plane is gone. Okay. We're going to DuPont Circle? Uh, what I don't know, I can learn. And what I know, nobody can teach. Excuse me for saying it about myself, but I think it's true. What do you think? Never uh, mind what you think. Okay. You drive me crazy. You drive me crazy. You drive me crazy. I'm supposed to be figuring this out for myself, and I'm in the car with you. What is that? It's like... No! So they, she, he goes to kiss her. She screams and pushes him away, and then they have a moment, and he goes in again, and then they kiss. Um, and then the scene goes on for another minute and 45 seconds, almost non-verbally. So I don't know how much of that was made up. I don't think that's a great ending. I don't think that would have really worked. It's certainly not the gooey, ooey romantic ending that I think anyone in the test audience that didn't like the first ending would respond to. But maybe that was Brooks sort of sabotaging himself. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. Because you would think that if they were going to go to the trouble of doing a reshoot, um, as you said, after the 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 production was pr- was principally yeah. over um and he wanted to try a different ending it's interesting that he wouldn't that he would that i mean it's obvious to me that it's it's you know it's like a uh, an improv scene at a St- stella yeah. adler or something yeah. there there there's no script yeah but he also thought that the, the actors would be surprised to find each other it's it's the whole thing is just an experiment right yeah yeah i mean it is. Otherwise, he would have had a maybe there is a scripted version. I don't know. I don't think there is. I mean, I think he I think he was in love with the idea that let's see what happens. Let's see where they go. And you can really I think it's actually her when she says the thing. Wait, are you coming with me or will you you know, like I think that to me is the moment where I realize it's kind of an improv thing Mm -hmm. where he's like, no, the plane is gone. Um she's kind of trying to find her bearings in the scene a little bit. You can he's coming in like a million miles an hour, of course. Right. Mm-hmm. So he, I guess he must have known what was going to happen. And maybe she was the character who, you know, maybe she as an actor wasn't informed by, like, I didn't get the sense when I heard Brooks tell the story, I didn't get the sense that Bill Hurt didn't know what was going to happen. I got the sense it was more about surprising Holly Hunter. Uh, that was my read too, that, that, that uh, it was supposed to, that she, the, uh, Bill Hurt was in on it, but, yeah. he, but he, she wasn't because he has this thing prepared, obviously. Yeah, uh, which which but also in a way this kind of points out what I was getting at earlier about what's brilliant about his performance. What I don't like about this also is he <clears throat> says on the nose everything that hasn't been said by him in his performance up to this point in the film. You know, he acts out all of this stuff in the film without really giving voice to it. And then here it's such a succinct, like 30 second speech where he has a hammer and he hits all these things like I'm good at this too. And the things I'm good at, they can't teach. And the things I'm not good, I can learn, you know, it's just, it's all on the nose. Yeah. Uh, So it is a weird experiment and it's strange as ever for me, it's always strange to watch outtakes on these DVDs and, and think about what might have been. I almost get like retroactively nervous that it ended up in the movie and ruined it, even though it didn't (laughs) like, I'd almost rather not see it. You know, I'd rather not know that it existed. That's how much I want to remain in the sanctity of the, final edited version of the film oh i agree i watched this clip uh getting ready for the getting ready for the podcast and in a way i kind of feel like it it ruins the um the original yeah. ending for me a little bit i can understand if other people want to see something different but um i was satisfied personally with the uh, with the uncertain ending that was that was used in the movie and this kind of took the characters just a, just a little bit into a, a place where yeah. um I, I started to disbelieve them and um, as I mentioned, there's 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 about four really good uh, articles uh, about the making of broadcast news that Rick and I shared with each other. And I'm going to put them in the link to the podcast description so people can go a little bit down this this wormhole. There's a great piece in The Ringer uh, by Haley Malotech, uh, which is a really, really well written kind of assessment of broadcast news and what it tells us about the news moment that we're living in. Um, and there's a couple of other ones that I'll put links to in there. So, you know, I really enjoyed experiencing the movie again and watching it a few times. I have a newfound appreciation for it and I appreciate you coming on again, Rick. Do you have any final thoughts on broadcast news or do you feel that we've actively covered it? 
Well, I think we've done a pretty good job. I was interesting that you um, gave me the chance to come on here and talk about first network a couple of years ago. And yes. then this one, because I think uh, a lot of people kind of, um, conflate them because of mm. the uh, subject matter, but they really are totally different approaches uh, and both excellent films um, in their own, yes. uh, in their, you know, in their own accomplishments. Uh, and I'll also say that uh, uh, I've come a lot, I've, I've come up on broadcast news after getting a chance to watch this a mm -hmm. couple of times in preparation for the podcast. I like it a lot better than I used to. Why did you, th did, before it was a little too mainstream for you? Uh, I think it was a little too mainstream hetero for me. It was yeah, I'm not a big rom com <laughs> guy. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what we what this era is exactly as far as these sort of like late eighties, early nineties, yeah. you know, prestige comedies. There's a mm -hmm. lot of movies that look a lot like each other. Yeah. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's everybody's copying James Brooks. I don't know if it's uh Polly Platt had great influence over the art mm. design. Yeah, a lot of times it's the music too, right? I mean there's mm. every one of these movies, these, you know, your terms of endearment, accidental tourist, Prizzy's honor, they have a lot of the same actors and then a lot of the uh the uh score composers will use this um sort of synthesized strings uh to create uh, a kind of a, a warm uh a warm musical mm. experience around uh around these prestige comedies and a lot of the movies kind of run together for me and I, i'm not sure what we call this era hmm. hi it's jason with a brief interruption the conversation that rick and i had about broadcast news continued from this point forward and you'll hear the entirety of it but after we finished recording rick brought up an interesting topic which I hit record on because I thought it was worthwhile including here only because while it's a complicated topic and not an easy one to conveniently or quickly address, I think we did justice to it in terms of addressing some of the allegations of domestic violence, which have been alleged against William Hurt from an earlier part of his life and career. So I'm not going to speak too much about it here. I'm going to let the conversation play for you as it did for Rick and myself. So here's that portion of our conversation, which took place after we had finished recording the episode. About him, um, you know, n never knew much about what was going on behind the scenes. I don't really care, except mm -hmm. that it turns out I do care. And uh, he was a real douche. Um, you know, with all his wives and girlfriends. And, and I'm, uh, I'm just having one of those moments where, you know, like you find out that somebody that you, somebody from Hollywood or news or whatever it is, that you just find out that that off camera, that they're not a very good person. Well, yes, that's true. At that time of his life, he was an mm -hmm. alcoholic and a drug addict. And so were many of his partners. Sure. Uh, Self-confessedly, uh, you know, I think um, uh, Marley, Matlin. Marley Matlin, you know, famously kind of slammed him and then uh, was a little bit more nuanced after his death by acknowledging that, you know, she was a drug addict at the time as well. And mm -hmm. his his statement about that, I thought, came from a place that he arrived at later in his life, which was sobriety. And he yeah. he was sober. Um, I looked into this <laughs> to try and understand when it was for him. The only references I could find at the time of his death mentioned that he had been sober for several decades uh, so yeah. I think he died. Was it just last year or 2020? Yeah. So 2021, I think. Yeah. So, so I think probably after this, you know, I'm not sure if it was during the making of this film in 87, 86, or if it was more 90, 2000, 2010 kind of era. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. But I do know that, yes, the sort of well-documented uh complaint side of that behavior is well known and, and is part of our understanding and awareness of him as a person and as an actor. Yeah. Unlike some celebrities who get sober, it seems to me, and certainly in my research, and I looked pretty, pretty hard. Uh, he never spoke about it. You know, he may have honored the anonymity portion of some programs of recovery. And in doing so, he may have not kind of corrected the record in a way that doesn't explain away those behaviors, but it sort of puts it in a context to say, yeah, that's how I behaved when I was out of my mind as an addict and an alcoholic. Uh -huh. I don't behave like that anymore. 
uh, because I'm not an active addict and alcoholic. And I think that's part of that seems to be part of his story, at least from what I could see in the stories about his death and what his family said about him and his children. Um, It doesn't sound like he was a monster his entire life. And I think it's an interesting narrative to get into, especially in nowadays. And I was referencing Mm -hmm. this a little bit with people like James Franco or Army Hammer, who have made these very pointed post recovery mea culpa interviews yeah, and try to offer context of the sort I'm talking about. And of course in today's climate, it just, no one has time for it. No one's going to bother to listen for the two hours or to read the entire article or put it into context. It's just, we don't live in that time kind of to the point of broadcast news. Mm-hmm. So I know what you mean, but of course I see it a little differently as a sober person myself. And I think yeah. that's part of his story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't pay, I didn't pay a lot of attention to what went on with him after, uh, you know, after this period, there definitely seems like there was a, a big lag maybe in the nineties and early two thousands where I think directors might've been, uh, avoiding casting him because he was a problematic, uh, and demanding actor. And he got kind of, he got a bad reputation because obviously he was such a huge guy in the eighties. Um, but, and that was the time when he was, you know, cheating on wives and cheating on girlfriends and every single one of them during this period uh came back to talk about his uh abuse physical Mm -hmm. sexual psychological Mm -hmm. um so maybe that's something that uh after a certain like you said after a certain period of time um he uh he uh he became a better person i don't know yeah i mean i think it certainly seems that that was the case um And it's funny because it brings up the question, as I said, of, you know, if you talk about it as a person of note, you, you, you can not, you know, not cover up anything that you did because that wouldn't be part of the program of recovery. As I understand it, it would be acknowledging that, which seems to be what he did. And his statement about the Marley Matinlin, I thought was, um, was, was very pointedly, um, coming from a place of sobriety. It sounded yeah. like the way the okay. way the, the way that was phrased to me, I read that as um, a very in sobriety uh, moment in terms of how he phrased that. It was very it, it took um, it, 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 it assumed accountability mm-hmm. and it offered a little context. This is what he said. I'll just quote it here because it's unfair to describe it without um, without actually quoting it. So after Marley Matlin published her memoir, which contained uh, these uh, abuse allegations, um, including rape and uh, psychological abuse, physical abuse, uh, he issued a statement following the publication. He said, quote, my own recollection is that we both apologized and both did a great deal to heal our lives. Of course, I did and do apologize for any pain I caused, and I know we both have grown. I wish Marley and her family nothing but good. Hmm. Now, as far as celebrity apologies, it's not an apology, really. I guess he is apologizing again. Mm -hmm. But as a piece of celebrity apologetic writing, this to me has a little bit more going on for it than the standard sort of publicist penned fare. Yeah. You know, because I think what he's saying, if we read between the lines is, and and what she acknowledged in a later statement after his death, what he's saying is we were both drug addicts and alcoholics. And yeah, we did stupid shit to each other. And I did stupid shit to her and she did stupid shit to me. Mm-hmm. And we have both apologized for that. And we have both become better. I think Marley Matten might be sober herself. I think that's part of her story. Sure. Um, his statement to me is the kind of statement that, reads to me like something a sober person wrote and it does not seek to um cover up her truth nor uh pretend that he wasn't an active participant who has things to apologize for so yeah he is an interesting uh test case in that and it would be interesting if anything else came out subsequent to his death if there's he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would do a memoir or anything, but 
Um, yeah, it's a very private sort of like you can't a lot of celebrities, you can say like, you know, so and so sober and you can find tons of interviews and tons of videos of them talking about it and all these things, which are great for mm-hmm. our purposes, because we could directly point to it and say, well, he got sober in 1992. And so yeah. what you're talking about takes place before that. And then there's this life after it and we have to put it in context. But I couldn't find anything where he referenced this at all. And the way he says it here, I know we both have grown. One way you can read that is I got sober a long time ago and I don't live my life that way anymore. Um, Yeah. So it does raise a very interesting uh, question. You're right. Yeah. I know in the case of this, uh, this movie that we're talking about that he, that he, uh, he got, he got cast in the movie and then he was helping um, Brooks to find who was going to be the female lead. They finally got Holly Hunter and then uh, at that point, uh, William Hurt was off to rehab. Uh, he went to Betty Ford mm. to basically get in shape I see. Uh, to make this movie. Uh, and I don't know um, how many times he was in and out of rehab mm. before or after that. But he was he actually if you if you do ever have a chance to um, check out that uh, Katrina Longworth um, uh, podcast, she goes into a lot of this detail okay. over the fact that uh, William Hurt came back from from his from rehab he was he kind of had all the language down as mm. far as you know dealing with dealing with uh um you know getting sober and that he actually talked polly platt into uh checking herself into rehab oh fascinating yeah i know that's yeah. part of her story too yeah. and um you know I, I think it's for what it's worth it's always hard to say you know, how much weight you can put on co-star you know, reminiscences after someone has died. But, you know, Holly was was very um, she was very complimentary towards William Hurt, as was Albert Brooks after his death, Uh, which to me, both of those people are pretty straight shooters. I would think that to me indicates that as you so I didn't know that, but that's that would make sense. It would be hard for me to believe that he could give this performance totally fucked up. Like he feels very present in all these moments in the film. So it makes sense that if he went to rehab before and maybe had stopped drinking. That would make sense Um, Mm -hmm. because it doesn't sound like I haven't read anything about him being a terror on this set or difficult in any way. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, she she said, well, Bill was like my first great mentor. He was an incredibly serious actor. It was sacred to Bill. And that sacredness, I loved that. It was a rare thing to see someone approach work with that vibe. So I felt Mm -hmm. safe with Bill. And Albert, Albert Brooks said, Bill Hurt, in a singular way, was, at his core, lovable. Some secret sauce of strength and vulnerability. Uh, R.I.P. William Hurt, so sad to hear this news. Working with him on broadcast news was amazing. He'll be greatly missed. So, to me, it does sound like a story of a guy who, like many people in Hollywood, was a complete and utter wreck. And perhaps, unlike many people in Hollywood and many people in life in general, found a way out of that and found a way to live without being an active addict and alcoholic. So... Um, it's a good point though. And, um, I've recorded this part of the conversation. So if you're comfortable with it, I'll let you know, we could always include it. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you, I, like I said, I don't, I didn't know if it was going to get, no, into, I think a lot uh, of people are going to have the same comment. I mean, a lot of people are going to think that he's, he's one of those actors that mm-hmm. for in a shorthand, you know, he's canceled, right? He did these terrible things. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it is, it is worthy of inclusion because it is part of someone's story and it is part of, um, Hollywood, right? This is what Hollywood is supposed to reckon with, by the way. You know, yeah. Well, Hollywood employed him when he was doing that stuff, or when he was being a, a difficult person on sets. It's like Hollywood has a lot to answer for in this regard that it hasn't answered for. And you know, my episode recently talking about the odd omission of any nominations for "She Said," the film about the New York Times reporters breaking the Harvey Weinstein story. I mean, if you've seen that film, it's insane that none of those female performances are among the female performances being nominated for Best Supporting Actress or Actor. Why is that? Do you think it's because the industry doesn't want to have those people stand on stage and address what they would have to address if they won an Academy Award for portraying part of that story? Of course, that's what it is. No, I think you made a really good point. I think that that um, I think the show is fine with. Uh, presenters going up there and talking about the war in Ukraine yeah. or yeah. Um, uh, you know Black Lives Matter, yes, matter or other things that might be important, um, you know, to mm-hmm. um, to people that political persuasion in Hollywood. But when it comes to um, turning the 
uh, pointing the uh, finger back at themselves, that might be that might be more difficult. I haven't seen the movie, so you know, I can't I, I can't comment on whether on whether th- I think that the performances mm-hmm. should have been. You know, it's a travesty that performances were not uh, nominations. But uh, I think your point is a strong one. Yeah, I mean, it's and it seems kind of obvious. Yeah, it's it is kind of obvious, and I think that's that's part of what Hollywood still has to wrestle with, which is. You know, these are not new things that occurred in, you know, the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s. You know, this has been part of the history and the fabric of Hollywood going back to the 1900s um, and stars behaving badly, uh, actors, filmmakers participating in a bohemian lifestyle, uh, existing outside the moral norms of its times. I mean, that's part of why people are interested and attracted to the industry, right? It's an alternative lifestyle. And it has traditionally afforded protection for people who participate in that alternative lifestyle, Um, except when, you know, the rat leaves the barn and we all have to acknowledge that we helped build the barn. (laughs) And that's kind of the moment that we're living in right now. And I think if you do see She Said, um, which is not a great film, but it's very worthy. It's a good it's a good newspaper film. And it certainly contains at least four phenomenal acting performances of yeah. the sort you would think would certainly be up there with the other kind of nominees. And the only reason I can think of that it's not is it doesn't want the moment. It doesn't want to have that happen on stage. It wants Jimmy Kimmel to make jokes and let's all feel good. So that's part of the history of it too. Okay. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, decide to somehow integrate this uh, uh, second conversation, I'm fine with it. We will leave it there until next time, Richard. Thanks again, as ever, for joining me on the full cast and crew podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Anytime, my friend. 